Spider-Man is arguably one of the most iconic superheroes in recent memory, with a relatable desire to help others while juggling his own school and social life. Spider-Man serves as a pillar of superhero culture, and with no less than three live-action film franchises to his name in the last 20 years, he is arguably one of the most recognizable superheroes of this generation. With each iteration of the wall crawler taking on his own identity with a different actor, director, and writing team taking their own spin on the character, it's fair to say that the character of Spider-Man has been divisive among fans as to who truly is the definitive interpretation of the character. Today, however, we are here to celebrate the cultural phenomenon that is Spider-Man in anticipation of Tom Holland's third solo outing, which has been widely rumored to feature two other iconic performances from the past 20 years. Stick with us, watchers of the Marvel Multiverse, as we explore the best qualities of each of the interpretations of Spider-Man and what makes each interpretation unique and interesting. Please remember, however, that this is a celebration Celebration. This is a video meant to honor each actor's contributions and unique takes on the character, and explore what makes each portrayal so vastly different. We are meant to differ in our opinions as to who is the best. That's the point of various interpretations. With that being said, conversation is encouraged, but we ask that you remain civil in your discussions down below. Each of us were brought here by our love for the web slinger. Each of us have our own personal favorite, and reasons for liking or disliking particular adaptations of the character. This, however, does not discount someone else's preference if they disagree with you because their reasons for having their own favorite are just as valid as your own. With that being said, of course, let's begin the celebration of the live-action Spider-Man. For the beginning of this video, let's go back almost two decades to a time when the superhero genre consisted primarily of Christopher Reeve's Superman and Michael Keaton's Batman. Marvel was on the brink of collapse beginning as far back as 1996, and was threatened by the impending doom of bankruptcy. In their fight to stay alive, they sold off the film rights to a little-known character called Spider-Man, who at the time was already a popular comic book character and inspiration to young children. Sony, after getting the rights to this character, commissioned Sam Raimi to forever reinvigorate the superhero genre with the widely acclaimed benchmark film known as Spider-Man, which soon became the first superhero movie to cross the $100 million threshold in the opening weekend. Starring Tobey Maguire in the titular role, Raimi's take on the story of Spider-Man largely meant setting up Spider-Man into a secondary role, instead focusing on the story of Peter Parker. This film thoroughly developed Peter into a lovable nerd who just wanted to do what was right. The strengths of the Raimi trilogy are largely centered around the depths of the characters involved. Each story that this trilogy tells centers around the characters first, while still maintaining a certain level of campy comic book surrealism that could have been torn straight from the pages of Marvel Comics. Tobey Maguire played the awkwardly nerdy Peter Parker to critical and commercial acclaim, while still being able to crack jokes as the witty Spider-Man. Though the infamous dance sequence in the third Raimi film is largely regarded as one of the biggest missteps of the trilogy, it is fun to celebrate the cultural impact that the scene has in recent years. The Raimi films were never afraid to be campy and have some fun with themselves while also injecting appropriate levels of heartbreak and tragedy that make fans yearn to ensure the characters are okay. The second iteration of the 21st century was portrayed by Andrew Garfield in the Amazing Spider-Man duology. Garfield's take on the character truly serves to bring the character into a new generation. While Maguire's performance of the titular web-slinger brought a certain level of surrealism, Garfield's Spider-Man feels like he could feasibly exist in our world as we know it. Garfield is unafraid to bring dark moments to a hero that has been widely optimistic and fun during his prior big screen outings. The death of Gwen Stacy at the hands of the Green Goblin at the end of The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is arguably one of the darkest scenes in any Spider-Man film to date. His descent into vengeance feels tangible after the death of Uncle Ben. His anger and pain are distinctly palpable as Peter Parker, but as Spider-Man, Garfield is still able to bring a charming, sarcastic web-slinger to the forefront, despite such dark circumstances. While Maguire had wit and made sarcastic remarks, Garfield leaned into the web-slinger's sarcasm to a level that Maguire never did. While many criticize his take on Peter Parker as being too cool and played by an actor who was too attractive, this level of clout helped him lean into the performance behind the mask even more. Garfield is most often seen as the weakest of the three main live-action Peter Parkers, but his performance should not be discounted, seeing as this is a celebration of all of the Spider-Man. It is important to recognize that Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man was a victim of circumstance and poor film writing and management. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 fell victim to being overstuffed with too many villains and plot threads, muddying the film. 
but it's important to remember that the third entry in the Raimi trilogy also fell into this trap. But the Raimi films had the stellar reputation of the first two to fall back on, and the mistakes were more easily forgiven by avid fans of the franchise. Garfield had a tendency to garner hate simply because he wasn't Tobey Maguire, which was largely unfair to him in his performance, and the circumstances of his film's productions didn't help. A fantastic actor who did the best he could with what he had. Garfield is still the favorite of many and did a fantastic job of revitalizing the franchise given the character he was inheriting and the magnitude of the expectations that fell on his shoulders. Finally, onto Tom Holland, the MCU iteration of Spider-Man. Tom Holland is widely regarded as one of the most comic accurate interpretations of the character, balancing the young looks with the shy, nerdy performance as Peter Parker and the witty, sarcastic performance as Spider-Man. Holland is widely regarded as one of the best balances between the two bringing a level of quirky invisibility to Peter that Garfield seemed to lack, while also a level of inexperience, wit, and charm as Spider-Man that Toby scratched the surface of but never quite obtained. Many point to the argument that he is too much of an Iron Man protege, riding off of the back of Tony Stark to make his name as a hero. But this simply not only isn't true, but is in fact the premise of his solo outings. Not only is technological enhancement a staple of Spider-Man stories, with Tony Stark providing the Iron Spider suit to Peter during Civil War storyline, for example, but Homecoming sought to strip Peter of his technological advancements and affiliations with Stark Industries. In Homecoming, Peter takes on the entire third act in his homemade suit in Web Shooters, learning how to grow beyond the need for Tony Stark assistance. Far From Home centered largely around the theme of legacy, and particularly the legacy of Tony Stark's Iron Man. Happy Hogan has a brutally real heart-to-heart -heart with Peter in which they both discover that they would never live up to Tony's legacy, nor would they ever live up to the legacy of Iron Man. Peter Parker's entire arc has been growing into his own hero and his own person, while escaping the shadow of Tony Stark that too many fans believe he is stuck in. As the MCU continues to grow and develop, we will get to see the culmination of this growth and see Tom Holland's Peter Parker truly grow into his own hero. His age during the Civil War movie was also a victim of circumstance, much like Garfield, only on a less severe scale. Peter Parker is not only iconic as an adult, but is equally as iconic, if not more so. The teenage years of Tony Stark or Steve Rogers are not as intriguing as the teenage years of Peter Parker. And seeing as the MCU had been in full swing for eight years by the time Marvel got the rights to use the character in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, he had to be introduced at the point where Iron Man and the Avengers were already staples of the franchise. Given Peter Parker's affinity for teenage issues, it would be a colossal misstep for the MCU to introduce Peter as a fully grown adult and miss the opportunity to explore his teenage years. After all, Peter still has time to grow into an adult, but there is no feasible way to get back in time and explore his teenage years believably after this opportunity is lost. Each interpretation, however, has their own distinct strengths, and instead of dividing one another based on these equally valid artistic interpretations, this video is meant to unite the fan base around their vast love for the web slinger. Spider-Man brought us all here, and our favorite interpretations are meant to differ. That's the point of having different franchises and exploring the vast potential of our favorite characters. But anyway, my friends, as we reach the conclusion of the video, who is your favorite live-action Spider-Man? And would you like to see Garfield and Maguire take up the mantle yet again in No Way Home? As we eagerly anticipate the release of the Spider-Man No Way Home trailer, I hope this video is a slight holdover for you guys. As always, my friends, hit that subscribe button to assemble and join our team, and have a great day.